Hey everybody, welcome to the wrong end of the snake. It's a webcast about touring, audio, and the relationships we have built between our road families. Tater and I have had an 18 year relationship on the wrong end of the snake with bands like Ted Nugent, Kid Rock, Slash, Stone Temple Pilots, Prophets of Rage, Iron Maiden, and most notably 10 years with Linkin Park. My co-host, Kevin Tater McCarthy, is a world-class monitor engineer with over 30 years in the business. I'm very proud to call him my friend. He has nine Top Dog Monitor Engineer of the Year awards and two Parnelli Monitor Engineer of the Year awards. I'm Ken Van Druden, a.k.a. Pooch. I'm a front house engineer with three decades in the music industry. I'm a three-time Grammy-nominated recording engineer, and I have eight Top Dog Front House Engineer of the Year awards. And I'm also a winner of the Parnelli Front of House Engineer of the Year Award. Let's do a little housekeeping. Uh, please use the chat window of the Zoom app to communicate amongst yourselves. If you are streaming from our YouTube channel and you want to be able to ask questions of our guests, register to be on the Zoom call for future episodes. Links to register are in all of our social media. If you have any questions for our guests, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom app and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the hour and then answer any leftover questions in our Q&A overtime episode. Look for that to be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a few days. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to visit our social media, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook is at Wrong of the, of the Snake. Tater, why don't you tell us about our guest this week? All right, today we have Miles Kennedy. Miles. Miles is one of the most talented rock stars that we know. In spite of his rock star status, he's one of the most humble and caring and giving persons that we associate with. Miles founded the band The Mayfield Four and is jammed with former members of Led Zeppelin, but most known best as the lead vocalist and rhythm guitarist for the rock band Alter Bridge and the lead vocalist for the band Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. He released a solo album called Year of the Tiger in 2018, and we eagerly await his second album soon. Let's welcome the man from Spokane, the pride of Mead High School, Mr. Miles Kennedy. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. Miles Kennedy. That is a... That what an introduction <laughs> Thanks for, first of all i have to say i I'm, i don't think i'm the pride of Mead high school Mead high school i think the pride of me Mead high school would actually be and you would know oh no, no, no god don't say it it's one of my most important questions <laughs> <laughs> all right okay okay i'll back up but i i'm also going to say this in in the during the introduction you guys have all these accolades grammy nominations all these yeah. The only award I've ever received in my life was in the sixth grade. I, I got the <laughs> reward award, and that's about the extent of my trophy collection. So well, let me just tell you, you deserve about 20 Grammys, dude. Oh, well. And you know what? Um, it'll come to you. It will. So I, I guess right off the bat, let, let, we're going to talk about sports and music today. Let's get the sports question out of the way. Who is the leading scorer of the Detroit Lions? My man, Jason Hansen. There we go. My main man. Jason Hansen. Yeah. So Jason Hansen, we went to, not only did we go to high school together, but we were, we went to elementary school, junior high. We were in the, uh, we were in number of, of band wind on some, he was an, an amazing trumpet player. He was always oh, first wow. chair. I think I might've beat him once or twice. I was usually second chair to Jason Hansen. And he was always and he was the the president of the high school. And I think he was the, I mean, he was like highest GPA in the history of Mead High School or something crazy. You know, he was that guy. And, right. and, and, and on top of that, he's, he's just a stellar human being. So oh, awesome to hear. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's, he is really a special, special human. For sure. just could, couldn't get us that Super Bowl win over here. Couldn't get us a playoff <laughs> win either. But, uh, I, that was uh, my special question for Miles today was I know, he, I know, I don't think Miles is a huge sports fan, but I know, I do know he knows the leading scorer of the Detroit Lions. All the time. <laughs> so we got that one out of the way. We used to play football in, in, during uh, recess. I mean, wow. that, that was what we did. And um, I don't remember him being 
I think he was quarterback a lot back when we were in, in, in elementary. And he was also a really great soccer player and he would destroy everybody there as well. So yeah, he's a force of nature. Yeah, guys. That's a trip. Like, you know, here in Texas, we're, you know, it's crazy. They raise their kids from when they're three years old to play football, you know, that kind of thing. You wouldn't think that where you're from, that that is like the thing, you know, but it's amazing. It comes from anywhere. Yeah. Um, let's back up a little bit and just tell us where, like, how did you become a musician? Like, where, where did your interest from music come from? And, you know, tell us a little bit of your story of your journey leading up to, um, you know, stardom well um <laughs> my journey to mediocrity is i like to say. <laughs> oh, come on man I'm, I'm, see just, this is it people this is it what i what we're talking about is the intro right here the most humble person that i know but also the most badass musician that i know so okay go ahead humble guy <laughs> uh anyways uh, so it start okay i think the journey really started when i was about four years old and I was watching Sesame Street and uh, on this particular episode, Stevie Wonder was the guest. And wow. that was the moment. That was the moment where I wow. remember it. So it's as in fact, as a child, I think that might be one of the most vivid moments I, I have is seeing that it just did something. And that's what kind of started the journey. And um, I went through a sports phase in elementary because I was playing sports with Jason Hansen, of course, you know, and, of course you would. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I was, I wanted to be an athlete. I kind of ventured away from, from music for a while. I didn't play an instrument or anything. And fortunately in the third grade, my mother, uh, she said during dinner, she's like tomorrow they're having a, uh, gathering where the local music store is showing up so we can rent an instrument and I want you to play in the band. And I was like, Oh man, I don't know, you know? Um, but I'm, I'm glad because that, that is what opened the door. I played, I picked up the trumpet. I think we rented it for, I don't know, $30 a month or whatever it was. Right. And, uh, and that, so that was the, that was the beginning. And, um, I liked it. I wasn't on fire for it. It wasn't until I heard, I, once again, I was in the backyard playing with my little brother and I heard a uh, little, little guitar solo by um, Eddie Van Halen. I heard eruption and I was like, okay, whatever's doing that, that's <laughs> the trumpet. That's what I want. <laughs> so yeah, that was, the, that was the, uh, that was the beginning and, and of the uh, instrument and in, that in would lead to playing in bands and whatnot. And I uh, was just obsessed with it, man. I just would sit there for, I mean, I just lived it. Uh, my GPA dropped a full, they kicked me out of honor society within six months of owning a guitar because I, was, <laughs> I wasn't paying any attention. All I could was daydream during school about, you know, what I was going to learn that day when I got home. And um, yeah, it's just. And where did, how did you get that? Because we all grew up in an era where, you know, nowadays you go on YouTube and watch, you know, how someone plays and and then you kind of mimic it or whatever we didn't have that so what was your drive was it listening to records and just replicating things and trying to learn eddie van halen riffs and is that is that how that happened for you all, yeah i mean it was uh, the, the, it was such an empowering i'll never forget i was with a friend and he showed me a song called there was do you remember remember the what was it called it was at the it was something that MTV used to do. It was like a basement tapes or something where local bands would send in their video. And there was a band from Bellevue called Rail, which they, and they had a song and that's just over the hill from, from Spokane. You know, it's like four hours away. So they ended up winning and they were kind of a big local deal for a while. And so I learned a song called Bandit. That was the very first thing I learned. And then Breaking Law. And they're pretty, pretty much identical by, by Judas Priest. And um, so I that think that's like a prerequisite, you know, of guys of our age is you learn breaking the law. You just, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Like break. What is it about breaking the law? It's just, I don't so, know. <laughs> that's the it. it's so it's so simple and, and great. So yeah, that was the, okay, I think it was, it was listening, but also do you remember in the back of circus magazine, there would always be this thing, uh, the metal method with Doug, Doug, oh, Mark. yeah. Doug Marks. Yeah. That was, yep. that was it. I ordered all of those. And boy, that was like, talk about opening Pandora's box. I mean, power chord, what a, what a 
an incredible, you could learn this thing. You just take your finger and put it on the first fret. And then you take your finger and put it on the third fret, the string down, and you can literally play 90% of rock songs and make yeah. up your own songs. And yeah, so that was, that was before we had YouTube. That was before you, there was all this information. So you'd have to order things through the mail, you know? <laughs> What was your, I mean, for me, you know, I was the, the, uh, I'm the, uh, uh, frustrated guitar player that it never went anywhere. And so I became a sound guy, by the way. Um, so when I was a teenager, for me, it was like, um, that whole era of shrapnel records, right? So all these like shredders, right. you know? Um, so for me, it was like racer X, you know, it was like trying to replicate all that kind of shit. What was your genre? Like, what were you listening to mostly and trying to replicate? I went through so many phases. I, I did go through a shredder phase. I mean, uh, a shrapnel. Oh yeah. I mean, um, Vinnie Moore. Yeah. Vinnie hell yeah. Moore. I mean, that guy, I, I loved, I loved that mind's eye record. Um, uh, but then I graduated into, I don't want to say graduated, but I moved into um, fusion. Fusion was a was a big one. I started as more of a rock guy, kind of a metal kid. But then when I heard Chick Corea's electric band and Frank Gambale, I was like, well, what is that? You know, what's going on there? And then I saw I saw the uh, performance. They came to a, lo a local college and played. So I went through quite a fusion phase. Uh, Mike Stern. Um, you know, I still love fusion. I still put on weather report and. And I do totally too. Yeah, that's amazing. Right on. Good and stuff. Did, did your parents have music going on in the house when you were growing up? I mean, you said your mom got your uh, involved in the trumpet. Was it? Were they music listeners and aficionados? My my biological father definitely was. He was. Uh, I think that's where both my my brother and I got the musical gene from. Uh, he was a, uh, a a very good musician and. Wow. Um, but then he wanted to, the story is, which I always I think about this. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting. He wanted to be able to provide for his family. So he uh, became a computer program really early on. This was in the late sixties, early seventies. And uh, he was, um, you know, uh, programming computers and whatnot. So, but the, I think the love of music and all that, I know he was playing Scott Joplin all the time. He was, you know, big and big, he was a big muso from what my mom told me. And, uh, and, uh, so I think we definitely got that from him. Fantastic. Wow. That's amazing. So I, you know, you are perhaps best known now as this amazing singer, which you are, but you are such an underrated guitar player. Um, one of the things that I always tell people, you know, when they talk about Alter Bridge, I say, yeah, Mark Tremonti's a monster, but have you listened to the solos that Miles plays? <laughs> so I think it's it's interesting how you ended up as being, you know, I think it's because you're labeled as the lead singer or whatever, but your your talents were first on the guitar. How did that lead to to voice? Like what what was the journey to that? When I started writing songs, um, I needed to someone to, to sing them. And there's a finite amount of, of folks to draw from here in Spokane. So I eventually realized that I was just going to have to man up and get over my, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, there's something about being a front person. It's, it's a fear. A, yeah, totally different thing. And I'm not, I don't think I'm necessarily hard, hardwired to be that guy naturally. And it's something I've had to learn to had, I've learned to put on and wear when, when needed, but uh, that was it. I was, I was writing these songs and I was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and just try and sing these, these tunes and see what happens. And uh, he, yeah, if someone would have told me 30 years ago where this was going to go, I would have been like, no, no freaking way. There's just no, no way that's going to happen. Life is weird, kids. It really is. It is, isn't it? Like, you know, you don't know where your journey is going to end up, you know, and especially now it's such a weird time. Like our journeys are so on hold and, you know, heading us in weird directions. But um, so did you, when you decided you were going to start singing for your stuff, you just started singing or did you like pay attention to particular singers and like, I want to sound like that guy or I want, or I did a vocal coach or, you know, how did, how did that all play out? Yeah. I went through quite a, quite a, 
uh, quite a bit of learning. And initially, Stevie Wonder was that was what I was listening to and trying to mimic him. And both him and Marvin Gaye were really big for me. Um, and then there was a record that dropped after I'd been doing it for about two or three years, which was the Grace record by Jeff Buckley. And I was just like, wow, what is what's happening here? So I, I absorbed a lot of that, probably too much, frankly, because if you listen to the first Mayfield four record, it's like, well, that guy has a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and uh, I was just learning. I mean, I was still trying to, trying to figure things out. Um, and it, when the, the, the instruction came lessons and all that, that part came when um, it was looking like we were going to get signed Mayfield four uh, to a, to a major label deal. And there was going to be a lot of touring involved. And, and, the, and my managers were like, you know, you, you should probably go study, um, with this guy in LA named Ron Anderson, who is to this day, I, I feel like that was probably the, one of the most important things for my career was having the opportunity to learn from this. He's a master. He really he is, is. is unbelievable. I've watched him literally, you know, get a, a, a huge pop star, get hired by, or he get, he would get hired, show up and just absolutely change the quality of that person's singing ability. So that's so awesome that you got to work with that dude. I mean, that he's like, you know, whatever he's the, you know, I don't even know. He's the top guy in the, in when it comes to, to vocal training out there, guys. Yeah, I so. agree. And he's got a great, I, I should, uh, I should, I wish I had it written down, but just type, type it in. I believe it's called Vo Voix Tech. Um, and he's got like this genius thing that they've put together where you put on a, um, like a, a what are the, what are the, what are the things called? The, uh, what people play? Oh, games. the, uh, uh, VR, VR kind of thing. Yeah, the VR thing where you can hook up a VR thing and take this course and it's all online. It's genius. And so they launched that a, a little while ago. So, cause people, cause he is, you know, he's, he, he's obviously one, one person. And so he's, what's beautiful about that is he's taken all this information that's, and what he teaches from what, from what I understand is an old technique. It's, it's bel canto, essentially. It's an old, it's an old opera technique, which has been around for hundreds of years, but he, he is able to convey it in such a way to where it's, you can apply it to, to modern music. And, uh, I, it's amazing. Amazing stuff. So still to this day, you know, we've worked for a lot of guys that don't warm up, whatever, you know, you talk to, you talk to Dave Grohl and he'll tell you, yeah, I have like, you know, a shot of whiskey and a beer and I go out there and do it. You know what I mean? And there's no warming up. There's none of that kind of stuff, but you're, you're the guy that like warms your voice up and gets it ready to go. Right. Yeah. Now, when you guys toured with me back, what was it, years ago? I was a 2010. Yeah, yeah, 2010. And I would warm up for, I mean, 45 minutes to an hour, and I had this whole thing, and it was very, it was a little over the top. And since then, you'll be happy to know I figured out a new way to kind of edit it down. So now it's about 15 minutes, okay. and. The beauty of that is, is you don't burn your voice out before you go on stage. So you've got a little <laughs> more left for the actual show. And that was, and you know, who told me that, who kind of brought that up was Pete Merluzzi. Really? Our, yeah, oh, that's our, awesome. Our GM. He, yeah. he brought, he brought one day we were sitting there and he's like, and I was like, I, I gotta, I gotta do my warm up. Well, it's an hour before the show. I've got to do my warm up. And he's like, you know, you warm up for a long time. Have you ever thought that maybe you're kind of burning your voice out? I'm like, wow, you could be right, Pete Malusi. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you could be right. <laughs> we love Pete. Pete, uh, we had him on as a guest, uh, I don't know, three or four shows ago, and, yeah. and um, he's amazing. I, I could see Pete saying that. I could yeah, save I can some too. of that for the show. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly what he said. That's yeah. exactly what he said. Yeah, I love Pete, too. What a character. <laughs> now, what was your first concert you went to, Li live concert you went to? Live rock and roll show. That yeah. would be uh, Sammy Hagar on the VOA tour. Wow. Hebra oh, opened the show. Man. Tell me what you want. Uh, yeah. So that was my first. And the deal was that was 1985, January 1985. And I wanted to go to shows, but my parents were like, no, you're not, you know, you're not going to, to a rock concert. Um, so when they, the deal was when I turned 15, 
then I would be allowed to, to go. And that was the first uh, concert that rolled through town. And I got to say, uh, Sammy did a wonderful job uh, indoctrinating me into the world of live rock and roll. It was a, it was a really fun show. Yeah. The Red Rocker has another satisfied customer. Thanks. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had any interaction with Sammy like later on now and have said, hey, dude, you were my first concert or whatever. Have you ever had that conversation? Yes, I did. It was about five years ago. We were playing a, um, a Kings of Chaos show. It was a benefit of, uh, for Rick O'Berry's uh, Dolphin Project. And it was in San Francisco. And I, he was one of the folks. And I pulled him aside and said, just so you know, you were the guy. And he was so, you know, he's so cool. He's Sammy. He's great. Yeah. That's when you When you sell your tequila company, life is good. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you got nothing but smiles. <laughs> Yeah. When you're uh, as huge as uh, Sammy Hagar and you're, you're making all kinds of money making music, but then your tequila <laughs> yeah. and all makes of a sudden, you billions. Yeah. Your side project. Yeah. Your right. side project. That's amazing. And good for him. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you're, you're traveling down this journey. You go to the May- Mayfield for what happens there? Like what did it just didn't work out? Right. Like the, the project you guys made a cup, two records, I think. Two records. Right. Yeah. We were, we were, it was an education in how the music industry works. You know, every, every young band or a young artist is like, if I could just get signed, you know, know, we're off to the races. Well, the reality, at least back then, the number, the, the, the number that I heard was um, it's only five or 3% of artists that ever recoup in other words that are able to to pay back what it costs to make the record and you know tour tour budgets and all that stuff or tour advances or whatever and uh, yeah you know it was look that one was i hate to say it it was kind of doomed from the beginning because we were we were just getting ready to make that the first record and the we were signed by an awesome a and r team and we really liked them we had a few different labels that were which was a good position to be in. We had the yeah. kind of the, I don't want to say bidding war, but we had four labels that were really interested. And, and uh, so that always helps in negotiations. So we got this wonderful deal with Epic. And, but one of the other things that was really, imp- I think drew us to, to that label was the president at the time came to the show, came, flew all the way across over to Seattle to see us play. And, and that when you, when you know the president's on, on board as well, that really is a motivation to sign on the dotted line. <laughs> And we found out like you know, just a few months after we signed and then we were getting ready to make the record that he was no longer at the label. So that, so that, that's, that's yeah. Right. So, I mean, it does, you could make, you can make the white album. It's, it doesn't matter. It, it's really, there's such a, there's, it's, you know, you've got the machine and every, you know, you have people that are, that are uh, on your team and, and want you to succeed at, at the, at the machine and it will help, help kind of, facilitate that and when one of the main people is, is gone that makes it harder obviously um, but we still have people there that believed in it and it's, it's not a diss on them it's just it would i always wonder if things would have worked out a little a little bit differently because uh um it was a tough time it was a tough five years you know we were just kind of just struggling to get by but we made the second record in particular the second skin record i'm still it's probably top two records for me, when I look back at the catalog overall, you know, I just, that there's something about that record. And I still have friends that, you know, are like that, that's their number one of all the records was the second skin record. And I, so I'm, I'm proud of that. You know, I'll always be proud of them, proud of what we, we accomplished. Did you get, uh, did, uh, did they go on any touring involved in any of those records supporting any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So we did, we on the very first record we toured, I want to say it was about a year and a, probably a year and a half, something like that. And we toured with uh, a number of bands, but it was, there was this little band that was just starting to blow up called Creed. And we toured with them in the summer of 98. And um, that was obviously what kind of led to something later, later on down the road. So they were, they were one of the bands. Some of the fondest memories I have were, are you guys familiar with Big Wreck? Oh, absolutely. Can- yeah. Canadian band? Yeah, Canadian yeah. band. Yeah, yeah. Normally in the crew. So well, those tours, we did some stuff up in Canada. And uh, those those were just, 
uh, so important for, for, for me because I would sit on the side of the stage and watch them every night. Ian and I got to be good friends. And um, it was just such a, a, a res- such a, a level of respect that I had for what they were doing. And, and so that was, as a music geek, that was, that was a tour that I, or a few tours that I really, really, um, I'm, I, I look at fondly. Those were, those were good, good times. And, and learning experiences. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in fact, you know, a lot of the alter tunings that I use, that was, that, that Ian showed me a lot of that stuff. One time we were hanging out, I sang on their second record, the pleasure and the greed the track, t- track 10, I sang on, and I, I was down in LA and as I, I was doing demos for the second Skinner, so this would have been 2000. And Ian and I would, they were, I think they were staying at, I'm trying to name, there was, there's like these apartments that artists would stay at down in um, Burbank area. Not the Oakwoods. The yes. Oakwoods. We were the Oakwoods. Oakwoods. Yeah, exactly. We were at the Oakwoods and they let me, they let me crash in, in their, in their places. We were getting ready to, to track this song. And I remember one night we were up just getting in, tr- we would get into trouble. And yeah, we, as you do having a good time. And, uh, uh, <laughs> those are some good times, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, the, I, they were like, well, play some of the demos or play some of the songs you're working on. So I played this song called Lila. Uh, and I, it was in standard tuning or maybe it was half step down. And Ian was just like, well, why don't you, why don't you do that in open G? I was like, open oh, G what's, what's that? So he showed that to me. And that was when the whole alter tuning world really opened up to me. Um, and, and it's something that 20 years later, I probably use more than anything is all of, you know, open D open G and amazing and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So the first off a couple of things that I, people, I want people to hear that are watching this, you know, this, this webinar podcast is really about relationships and how, what your journey was to get to where you are. Um, and what I heard you say was, it really doesn't matter like how good your songwriting is if the business side of your whatever records, you know, record company management, et cetera, isn't, you know, part of it. That means that you could have the best songs in the world, but if you don't handle the other part of that, um, then, then you're not going to end up anywhere. Speak to that a little bit. Like how, how important was that? And where did you learn that from? Yeah. I mean, I think that I, it was, I learned it just through experience. There was so much, I just thought there was this magical portal you, you stepped into when you were signed to a major label and that was, it was just kind of going to work itself out. And that's not how it works. It's just, it's a very complicated, there's a look, it's, it's kind of like, you gotta, you gotta put in the time, you gotta put in your 10,000 hours, you gotta develop your craft. You gotta have the song. Look, it's, an A&R guy told me this once, and I do really ag- agree with this. It is, it's not the music business. This is the songwriting business. You've got to have those songs. So, you know, you can be the greatest guitar player, the greatest singer ever, but if you don't have the songs to back it up, people just aren't, aren't going to be interested. You might have a little niche that is like, oh, you know, ooh, look at, look at, look at that. But, <laughs> yeah. but the, the mainstream, they are just people in general. We love a good song. We love a good melody. We love a lyric with it. We can connect with or a, a riff that just like makes you want to whatever, you know? Um, but so it's your job as an artist to develop that. But then you also have to have the understanding that you need to surround yourself with a team that can then take that product. I hate, I hate calling it a product. Well, it, but it is, but yeah. yeah. It just, ugh, it just seems gross, but it, 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 you have to take that thing that your baby, your sonic baby, your vision, and then be, be effective at getting it out there and giving it a chance in, in the, and here's another, oh, I hate this one. Let me use it. The marketplace, you know? Right. So if you don't have that, it, unless you're really, really lucky and, and something just and, and occasionally that happens. They'll just be the, the, the planets will line up and everything will happen for whatever reason for somebody who, who might not have all of that in place. But generally speaking, you want a really great attorney, first of all, an attorney you trust, a business, you know, music business attorney, not just any, any attorney who understands contracts, who understands all of that. And I've been with the same attorney now 
for what is it almost 25 years oh, wow. uh, yeah i've been she's she's amazing and she is uh, such a such a huge part of 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 the process for me so i'm grateful to have that relationship and then your manager another both both your your manager who deals with you know the label and the touring and and all of that um and just for your listeners and watchers, you know, you have your, your, your regular manager, you kind of your general manager, and then you have your business manager when they deal with like the, the money and the, the taxes and the, and the accounting and all of that, the tour budgets and whatnot. And then you have your, and the, as you guys know, then there's the tour manager, but that that's with, with, with the tour manager, um, depending on what's, what's happening, that can kind of, uh, the, they tend to come and go depending on the, the entity and, depending on what, what's happening with the tour cycle and whatnot. But the people you need in place are, are at least for the way I look at it, is you want that, that manager, business manager, and that attorney. And, and they're very key components in uh, getting, uh, in looking after you. And, yeah, and absolutely. how much as an artist are you looking and double checking like a business manager? Monthly, I'm, six month, three month, yearly? In for, am I looking at like kind of going over their work? Yeah. How much are you just, we've, just you know, Tater is getting at that. We've worked for several artists yeah. that business managers have either honestly stolen from them or were just not good guys, you know? And so we're, we're just wondering as an artist, is that something that you think about and you double check your guy like all the time? I, I don't, I don't want to say I double check. Cause I, I do. We've been with, with, uh, uh, our business manager for, for years now, he's, he's him and his team are great. Uh, wonderful. But because I'm hardwired the way that I am to answer your question, how, how often every day. Wow. Every there you day. go. I'm, there I'm, you I'm, go, guys. That's the I'm, real I'm, deal right there. I'm, man. I'm, I'm, you know, not bothering him, but I'm no, just no. Like looking at, you know, things I need to look at to make sure everything's in place. That's just because you hear the, I don't want to be um, another uh, music statistic. Business. Cliche. Yeah. yeah. Statistic. I mean, how many stories do you know about guys who had all this s- success and, um, and then it was bet on, you know, somebody t- decided to go take the, the money and invest it in an alpaca farm or something, you know, uh, it's, it's crazy. And it's, a, it's a real drag. I mean, it happens all the time. You know, we've uh, Tater and I've worked for one of the biggest artists in the world whose business manager is in jail right now. So wow. So I, I always wonder, I, I've never asked an artist before how, how many, how much you check. And I'm sure it's different with everybody, but I was just hearing every day is uh, definitely assuring. And, and I, and on that kind of, on that kind of line, where you're talking about people's not only seeing your vision and sharing your vision, that's a great thing in life, knowing how to communicate to another person, how to see and share your vision. And I'm, I'm talking working with stage hands to try to get the show up or people working on your house to try to get your, your, what you want contractors to do what you want just in life, people sharing your vision. It's a, it's a good skill and it's a tough one and knowing how to uh, project it. Yeah, absolutely. It's when you find somebody that understands how to take your vision and get it from point A to point B in any medium. Yeah. Any medium. Yeah. I, I like the, the, you know, people who are in construction or, or, or whatever it is, if you have a vision for something that they can say, Oh yeah, you know, let's, let's do this. And, and then you start riffing with that person and, and then it, it can be better. And that's, yeah, yes. that, that there's that collaboration. So yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's really, it's really important. It is difficult though, because you, there, you got to kiss a lot of frogs before you can find that prince. Is that the right? <laughs> no, that's it, dude. That's, that's the true. truth, man. Definitely. Which brings up the point, you know, earlier on, um, you were talking about luck and how much does luck play into this? Like you, you definitely were very smart in putting together your team. You, you felt like, you know, you had some songs, all those kind of things. But w- what about the cliche of being in the right place at the right time? How do you put yourself in the right place at the right time? Th- speak to the songwriter that's out there right now and is struggling and trying to get their stuff heard. Yeah, that's a man. That's a really big, 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 big part of it. The luck thing is a big part of it. I hate to say it, but I do. What I have noticed is that the artists who are really tenacious and just they've they've got 
the the talent to back it up, but they've also got just that like tunnel vision where I'm going to get there no matter what. And they keep hitting roadblock after roadblock and eventually they break through. And so I think that that's, that's a big part of it for me. I, when I look at how my story played out, it's insanely lucky. And I'll tell you why, because I, I never intended though. I would kind of daydream about being a recording artist and touring the world. I was raised with very real ex, real, um, how do I say this to dream this big? It just wasn't realistic, especially because I liked living in Spokane. Spokane's not an entertainment um, Mecca. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not LA and it's not Nashville and it's not New York. Right. Or and, Detroit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Detroit, well, let's face it. I mean, Detroit's had some, some of the best oh, ever. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, you know, what, for me, what happened was there was a lot of luck in the, in the nineties, because as I was slugging it out, uh, here in Spokane and tra I, I traveled with my bands and we would travel to Seattle and we would travel to Portland and, and, uh, you know, that was, that was cool, but I, I got, um, I had some really just kind of interesting, uh, plays of fate that, that, uh, came into, came into the fold, um, where I was playing with people who had managers who were big managers who then saw, uh, saw me and believed in what I was doing and then took me under their wing and then started passing the demos out. You know, what happened is I was playing in, um, I was filling in for a friend. We played in high school, high school band together. Uh, and he moved on to Seattle in the early nineties when the nineties were, were blowing up and he started playing with, um, um, a band called Inflatable Soul, which were um, the, some of the Cornell uh, family. Great, great band, great people. And um, long story short, Joel, I don't know if he left the band or he decided he just needed a break. So I filled in for Joel for, for a little while as their guitar player. And um, long story short, their their manager, Susan Silver, saw me at a show and, and um, kind of took me under her wing and really helped, you know, helped us. If, if that hadn't happened, I don't know if I'd be talking with y'all. So, so that was my, that was my lucky break. That was your, that was your moment. Yeah. You know, and what I hear you say is that what we've been stressing for in these, you know, 40 episodes that we've done, which is that it doesn't matter how good you are, but it's the relationships that you develop in this industry that will take you further than, than anything else. Right. Yeah. Um, and speaking of relationships, uh, what, uh, we're getting, you know, bombarded by questions by people. And so we want to get to a couple of those, you know, cause we have listeners that want to want to learn stuff about you. Um, and, uh, Jessica Santiago says, uh, have you ever been starstruck when meeting another musician and who was it? Oh Yeah. <laughs> who was it for you and what's the story all, all the time um i mean the first time i met stevie wonder that was that was a big deal and that's a funny that's an interesting story because it, um i was staying at a hotel in la and i was with a friend this was like in 2008 or 2009 and i was uh, stay i was hanging out with my buddy brian sperber who who's a uh, who's mixed a few alter bridge records and awesome cat and we were sitting up on the pool talking about this record we were going to make together. And he somehow we got on the subject of influences. And I was just like, well, Stevie Wonder, that was the that was the one for me initially. And he was just kind of like, but you're a rock guy. And it was kind of an interesting discussion. And and, uh, and we're sitting there for about two hours having a couple of drinks. And all of a sudden he said he looks up and he says, there's your guy. And I'm like, I mean, no one was really there. It was empty. It was up on, the, on a rooftop pool. No one's there. And I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I look up and Stevie Wonder just walks out. Uh, it was crazy. And he was there with his family. And I was just like, I'm freaking. I mean, I am. Freaking, oh, my God. Wow. Freaking, like shaking like a little girl. And um, <laughs> and so shaking like a little. I should that that sounded bad. At, at a, <laughs> <laughs> concert in 1965. I mean, like shaking, like, what does that mean? A fa I was a, I was a fan, you know, obviously. Yes. And so, uh, so anyways, 
He's like, you should go say something. You should go say something. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to go say, I don't want to bother him. He's here with his family. No, let's just, let's just let him be, leave him be. So about 15 minutes passes and, and Brian says, Hey, can I borrow your phone for a second? I'm like, sure. So I hand him my phone and all, he just beelines it for Stevie. And I see him over there talking. I'm like, Oh no. So he did the, here it comes. <laughs> my friend, take a picture with you. Yeah. And I was just, oh, I was that guy. I was just, I was just. Yeah, but you had to be, right? He's a living legend. So yeah. come on, you know? Yeah. What was it like? I want to know the uh, meeting Jimmy Page story and how that went down. Like, because I mean, like if I walked into a room and it was Jimmy Page, I think I'd lose my shit because it was a major deal in my life. You know, how was that for you? It was it was amazing. Um, it was, you know, it was the same thing for me because he wrote the, you know, he was the guy, um, him and Eddie, Eddie Van. Yeah, right. So yeah, when that, when that, that happened, I was on the road in 2008 we were doing the festivals. We'd just done rock and ring or rock, which ones I can't remember which one we were on our way to the Nuremberg one, That's uh, rock and ring, rock and ring. Rock and ring. Yeah. We were, we were on our way to that. I get a uh, basically long story short, I get a text from Jason Bonham who I hadn't seen since we did rock star. And he says, can you call me? I have a favor. And I'm, I thought it was going to be, Oh, he has a friend who wants to come to a show and we'll set him up, I call him. And, and it was basically, you know, me and some, some friends and I are, are jamming this weekend. And we would, we we're wondering if you could come to London for just, you know, to jam. Jesus. <laughs> uh, no, I'm busy this yeah. weekend. Can't yeah. make it. It was, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So, so cut to flying there. Um, uh, and it was, I go into this, I, I met Jason. It was awesome. I hadn't seen him. I love that guy. We drive to the studio, I walk into this little studio. It's just a re little rehearsal studio. And I hear just this amazing, like Bill Evans thing coming from another room. Someone just nailing it on the piano. And I'm like, wow, who's playing piano in there? And I walk in and it's, there's John Paul Jones. And I was just like, oh, geez. Wow. You know, I mean, that guy, holy mackerel. And he was so cool. And uh, then I look to my left and in comes, in comes Jimmy. And I'm <laughs> like, is, this, is there a chance that this is all like some sort of virtual reality? Either this is totally, or this isn't, there's no way this is actually happening. I still sometimes, to be honest with you, I'm like, I, and I always say this when I tell this story, because it's just like, why some, why me? Why some kid from Spokane? It's just very interesting how this is all played out. But um, I did have a bit of a Chris Farley mo moment where there, uh, and I still, I still kick myself when they were sitting there and we just get, were kind of getting to know each other. And oh, I know the, I did the Chris Farley basically like, well, you guys are like wrote the blueprint for everything I do and things. <laughs> and immediately they just kind of look at me and I'm just like, oh, I just started, I just saw that this Chris Farley's in <laughs> you know, he starts hitting his head, yeah. you know, so stupid, you know, but uh, they were very gracious and, and very cool. I and mean, they look, they know, they, they, they know, come on. How many people do that to them? And, and, know. you know, huge musicians must do that to them all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but um, so we're, you know, we got about 15 minutes left in this one. And then guys, we're going to take your Q and a that you've asked, and we're going to go to our Q and a session and ask all the questions that you guys have asked. So um, don't be, don't be sad if we don't ask your question right now, but um, what about, so you end up in Alter Bridge and then you end up in Slash and you're work, you, now you are working for two of the biggest, how do you end up in two of the biggest bands? Like how did, <laughs> like, how did that happen, dude? I'm convinced this is, none of this is real. This is all, just, <laughs> I'm going to wake up in some pod in about five years. And go your time on your time. This is the matrix, dude. We're in the matrix. Yeah. It's like, yeah. did you have a good time? Now put on your robe and leave. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I don't, I don't understand. I really don't. And I'm, I know that sounds like whatever, but I, I guess it all happened because of maybe it's a work ethic. Maybe that, maybe that's it. Maybe it's just a desire to, to create and a desire to, I don't want to say a desire to perform because that's not, I think some people 
as you, well, you, you know this about me. I mean, back when we, I think my Achilles heel, I've gotten better as, at dealing with it as time goes on, but I'm, I was never the guy that like, you put me on a stage and it was like, showbiz, this is wonderful. How y'all doing tonight? You know, I was, I'm just not that guy. I'm more of a song, kind of the artsy songwriter guy, like to right. sit and play guitar all day. So to put on that hat is, is sometimes a little, a little bit of a challenge. And, and you and I had talked about that when we toured together when, when, right. and it was really helpful. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up where you're just basically the idea, you know, what you conveyed was, look, you need to start believing in your, in your, your, whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is. And, and that was really important for me to, to hear mm. Cause I respect, cause I have, I have such respect for you guys. You know, you guys really are the best in the business. And so to hear, to know that, you know, on the other side of the snake, <laughs> somebody's watching the show night after night. And this is the, this is the uh, conclusion they're coming to. And it's like, I'm going to listen to what that, that guy says, because oh, you're very nice. He's you're, you, you, um, you know, you, 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 you get it. You understand. So I think that, um, now I've kind of gone off on a tangent where we're, well, I just, you, you know, we were talking about the, the, how you ended up in these two amazing bands and, and, um, you know, you were definitely when we were working with you was the early on part of that, you know, and, um, um, I saw you and you expressed to me sometimes how that was an anxiety level of being that guy, being the dude that's out there and, you know, um, because your, your, your absolute true talent, I believe is your songwriting. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, that you've just gotten so much better at that. You know what I mean? Like I watch stuff now and I'm just like, oh man, he's like, you know, he went from being the songwriter to being a, a true star and being able to manage all that. So that's, that's amazing, dude. Good for you. Well, it was, it was trial by fire. I mean, I had to learn. It's kind of like if someone throws you in the deep end, you got you, you need to learn how to swim. Yeah. And, and now I really enjoy it. You know, now I, I right. do enjoy, um, I enjoy that rapport with the, with the audience and, and all that, but it was, but, and you know, it's interesting because it, I never understood how so many artists would fall into the um, medicating aspect of things. And no, right. No, I didn't understand why people would get into drugs. Why would people get into drinking so much? Well, I think a lot of it is because when you're, when you're a creative, sensitive person, and so many of us are, it's that sensitivity, then you put them in the, uh, in, you know, put them in the ring, so to speak. And you're kind of, look, there are parts of it are great. There are people who are going to like you, but there are also a lot of people that you're a moving target at that point. And if you're sensitive and you're hardwired to where that will really affect you, you know, you, it makes sense why people start medicating and start getting into drugs and drinking to, you know, deal with that anxiety. So, so uh, what's your outlet? If it's not drugs, it's not alcohol. What is it that you use to get over all that? Well, at this point in life, uh, meditation is the, <clears throat> has been the, is the, is the coping uh, skill, which I started dabbling with in probably 2000. 8, 2009. Uh, I read this book called Effortless Mastery by Kenny Werner. And if, if anybody, it, it's written kind of for, for like jazz musicians and a jazz musician turned me on to it. But I'll tell you what, it's that book is full of so much incredible knowledge about the, the psychology of being an, uh, a creative person and an artist and a musician. And there was, <clears throat> there was a CD that it came with, which was like, uh, like four kind of meditations. And I was, and I'd never meditated before. And that was the, uh, that was my introduction into learning how to kind of control your, control your melon, you know? And I just can't be still when I try to meditate and I'm, I'm like, in 30 seconds in, I'm going, oh, I feel my, my butt. I got to scratch my butt. <laughs> and, uh, you know what I mean? It's like, it's the hardest thing to do meditation, isn't it? It is hard, but once you, I'll tell you what, man, once you get, and I still, it's something I, I, I try and do every day, but once you get to that place where you hear about, and I've, I've, I feel like I've, I've touched on it. I, I certainly have not gone to the level that I, I know can be attained with it. I'll never forget once it was last year or when it would have been last year, but it was a year. I think it was the year before the year before that we were on tour. We were, it was with slash the conspirators and we were playing Hellfest, and my voice was just 
beat up. I was tired. And I remember I went in the bus I was having anxiety. Obviously that's a big festival, a lot of people. And I wanted to be able to deliver, but vocally I was just tired that day. And you know, then you start spiraling. Sure. Like, Got to get control here. Let's get control. So I went in the front lounge and hit, went at it for 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, just, you know, super focus. And I'll tell you what, man, that was one of those moments where it was, I've never done hallucinogenic drugs or anything like that, but whatever was going on, it was just like this entire universe opened up and it so calm, calmed me down and got me just where I needed to be to go on and have a, a really fun, great show. It ended up being probably the funnest show of the entire tour. So I'm a huge advocate of, 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 of meditation and dealing. Let with me that. just say that at Hellfest, that can't be easy because where the buses park and the, the sh- I call it the <laughs> shelling doesn't stop all day. It's band to band to band. The shelling doesn't stop. The subs are shaking the buses all day. You're parked in the back. That's got to be pretty tough there. You know what? That's the power of it. It's like you learn to kind of deal with all of that. And uh, that's what's great about it. Yeah. But the shelling, it's true. You know how some some tours, it's just like you pull in that day and you're like, really? We got to, the buses are going to be right behind. Yeah. Age. And so, you know, if you're going to sit on the bus, it's just, you're going to be, it, it's boom, boom, boom all day long. Shelling doesn't stop all Shelling day. Shelling doesn't yep. stop. So no. you mentioned about the mental health, what physically for your ears and voice, is there any tips you can give any musicians out there, what you do on a day to day, or maybe a weekly or some sort of um, thing you do to stay healthy and keep your ears in shape and, and your voice in shape and maybe your fingers in shape and all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. I mean, as far as the ears go, I think we talked about this before you Tater, you know, this working with me, like my ears are shot, you know, I've got a mat. I'm not a- shot dude compared to some other people, yeah. believe me. But anyway, well, go ahead. <laughs> there, there's, let's put it this way. I have a nice dip at 4k and, uh, it, at last I checked it's gotten, it's down to about on my, on this year, I think it's down to about 55 DB. Wow. Yikes. Down, which is really bizarre because I do f- feel like I can still hear. So, I mean, you guys would understand, understand that your, mo- your mind is tricking it all to be there and everything trying to make up for it. Yeah. yeah. There's psychoacoustics to it yeah. as well. That must be it. I still have the top, the top ends fine. I mean, like if you get above Super 10, sparkly 10, 10, 10, 10, bits. Yeah. 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 I still hear that fine. But um, so yeah, the, the, the trick is thank goodness for in-ear monitors, you know, thank goodness for Jerry Harvey and what, you know, I, I, I don't know what I would do without, having uh, good in-ear monitors that I don't have to set on stun to, to hear myself. Right. right. So that's a big part of keeping your, keeping your hearing in check is keep your stage volume at a reasonable level. Um, and as far as the, the health, just overall health goes, I mean, I try and, and it's not, it's not very rock and roll, but you know, I try to exercise and do all that stuff and keep, keep the, keep the body and the temple healthy and free from problems. As far as guitar stuff goes, um, I just play a lot and I do a lot of wrist stretches and I've, I've started having problems with uh, my wrist. I've got some, something they need to take a look at and see about fixing, but other than that, everything so far, so good. It's still working. So far, so good. And I'd like, I'd like to point out something you didn't bring up with your, with your ears is, you know, you knew parts in the set when to unplug and take a break, which was in- instrumental to me. Was so, so smart. A lot of people don't do, you know how to pull the, pull the rip cord on it for a few minutes and put it back in. I was always very impressed by that to know, to know your body and know what it took to, to save yourself to do that. Well, you, it's interesting you're bringing that up because I, and I think about that often. It's, it's great because I can do that with slash the conspirators with alter bridge or with them solo stuff. It's, it's, difficult because i'm playing guitar as well there are no there are no there's no respite for and you but you brought up the idea that it's it's not necessarily just the volume but it's the length to which you're uh exposed you're exposed so the so that i think that's when the idea of like well unplug if slash is going to do a solo i'm going to unplug my my cable and let give my ears a, a, a break and, and some of those solos are really long. Yeah, so long. Yeah. there's a lot of time for, you know, to, yeah. everything to kind of bounce back. So yeah, that was, I remember that conversation really well. Uh, no, I did, I cause did. I didn't know that. I thought it was just like, it's just a matter of up or down. If it's too loud, then that's going to ruin your ears. But it's also just, I mean, 
I, I'm assuming like you could be at 90 dB for, for an hour and that still could do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So giving your ears a break is really the deal. Um, and it, it's funny, you know, you, man, this is a whole down a rabbit hole topic, but the, the reason that OSHA has measurements is because they measure things with solid lengths of time. So six hours of exposure at 90 dB will cause hearing damage, for example. But music is not that it's it's moving SPL levels. And it's been proven that if you take time to give your ears a break, even if it's only two minutes, that, you know, the exposure time of that is not dangerous at that point. All so, right, um, Anyway, hey, we're getting uh, short on time here, and I don't want to leave this live session without talking about your new record. Yeah. So tell us how it came about. Was it because of COVID or was it something that you were, you know, like, how, how did it all come about? Was it something you've been working on for a while? The plan was to release it last year, whatever. Tell us the whole kind of story behind it. Yeah, it was inspired by the basically the lockdown in terms of, that was the motivation to, to write and have something to do. Alter Bridge was in the middle of an album cycle and we wrapped up a U.S. tour at the end of February. And starting in March, I was like, oh, I don't know how long this is going to last. So I just started working. I just started writing. And before I knew it, uh, I had a I had a record. A lot of the themes, a lot of the the the, the narrative is, was inspired by what was going on at the time because we didn't know there was there were so many unanswered questions and I think that uh, me being a bit of a um, kind of a I I, I don't want to say a news junkie but I was watching way too much news and 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 kind of being bombarded with all of the stuff and so it was starting to make its way into the into the narrative. And, um, and then also just the, the emotions, just the feeling detached and, and uh, the longing to get back out. And there were just so many things to draw from. And as a, as a writer, when you're, when you're put in those positions, uh, you, it's, it's best to, to, to go ahead and explore it because there's so many times as, as, a, as a creative person where you don't have anything to draw from. And that's the worst feeling in the world. So when the well is full, you just, you start you start dipping into it. And uh, so, yeah, the Ides of March. Um, it's, Where does uh, everybody find it? When does it come out? It comes out, it comes out in May, uh, the single in stride just dropped last week. And uh, you can find the record in, I believe, May 14th. I should know this, the, the <laughs> drop date. I'm such, I'm that guy, right? I think it comes out in May. Uh, but uh, you can go to mileskennedy.com for the, for all the, for the info. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be, to be getting that one out. And any shows or any anything kind of planned to, to promote? I know it's tough now. I mean, if you can do anything, can, can you do anything? Are you going to do anything? I hope so. I, sh I sure hope that, uh, you know, the things can open back up. I think initially, if I do anything, I would assume it's going to be more one man show. I think that that will be. A, yeah. A band, the idea of a band at this point seems pretty hard to. To but do. you you've done one man shows before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love doing the one man show. I did that on the year of the Tiger Run, uh, and it it harkens back to what I used to do back in the '90s. I used to play coffee shops. As the, I was a kid with the acoustic guitar that would irritate people. Like we're trying to drink our coffee. Shut up, kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But, how yeah, do you, as a songwriter, like how do you separate what song is like? Oh, this is a slash song. This is an Alter Bridge song. This is my song. Like how do you? Yeah separate those um they all have such a distinct vibe right it was a little more challenging with this record in terms of how blues based it is and how it, and it rocks a little more than than you're the tiger did um so th the distinction wasn't as easy to make at times uh the, the title track the ides of march was actually bordering on you know could that could have almost gone into alter bridge territory yeah it's uh, funny i listen when i listened to it i was like oh okay this is kind of an alter bridge song but yeah. but but your own bluesy take on it especially with the slide part which was rad right yeah right. so yeah it's it's something you just kind of learn to do as time goes on have you ever been in a situation where one of your three artists like you play them maybe a song that you thought it was for you and they heard it and went, oh, man, we got to do that song. Did that ever happen? Sure. That ha yeah, that happened. 
happens all you know it's interesting i'll tremani mark tremani this was years ago when we put out apocalyptic love with with the slash conspirators and there was a chorus on uh standing in the sun which was one of those dream core it was one of those things where i woke up one morning we were touring uh and i heard i had this this core progression and this musical melody in my head and i just recorded it on my phone didn't think anything of it long story short slash and i ended up putting it into a, one of the songs. And when we got the first single back, I was in the bus on tour with Alter Bridge. Oh, so shit. Back and forth. And, and Mark told me, you know, he heard me playing it in the back lounge. And he was like, oh, man, I wish you to save that chorus for Alter Bridge. <laughs> oh, man. You never yeah. know. Once in a while that happens, you know. That's weird. So now there's this jealousy between two huge bands. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's, all good. it's all supportive, but it's happened. Certainly happened where I'll hear a, a, a chorus Mark will use on the Tremonti records. And I'm like, man, you should just save that for an alt bridge. I love that chorus, you know? Oh my goodness. Wow. That's just crazy, man. Um, well, listen, Tater, I know you have a million questions. Oh, Do you sure. want to ask one more? Um, We've got just a few more minutes here. If you want, um, do you, yeah, let's let's touch on this because I don't think we'll touch it in the Q and A. Uh, real quick, I guess uh, you have a, a, a SAG card because of the of a movie you were in, Rockstar. I'm sure, right? And you get your annual. I don't. Your, oh, you don't. You don't. It, okay. Oh, someone told me to get a SAG card. <laughs> oh. I'm, sure I could have, I'm sure at this point I would have some sort of free buffet somewhere if I had yeah. it. Yeah, that's right. So how did that, like Pooch was talking about earlier about the, you know, being in the right place at the right time. And that, that kind of, that part you played was kind of right. Being at the right place at the right time. But how did that part really come about? How did you get that? So the first Mayfield four record was mixed. It was produced by Jerry Harrison, but it was mixed by um, Brendan O'Brien. Right. Uh, wow. Story short, Brendan uh, was friends with one of the people who were involved with putting the rock star film together. I think the, one of the musical producers or, or something, and they had been looking for that character for a while. They wanted someone who could be the, the Thor character and sing the part. And so, oh, uh, and sing the part. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so, um, so yeah, it was Brendan that put in the good word and which I didn't find out till much later. And, uh, I called and thanked him. Um, and, and he's, he's somebody I have such, always respected so much because he's such an amazing producer so i was just i was just going to ask you how yeah, he's great amazing. is he and he's an awesome guitar player too right oh, so good yeah. he's, he's so he yeah he's he's amazing yeah yeah and, um one of the questions i saw earlier and i don't know where it is exactly but something along the lines of how much input you have i know you decide like who's going to be your producer who's going to be your recording engineer for what you work on for your records and and you've worked with um you know elvis the same guy for a long long time um but what about touring how much input do you have into choosing the crew uh that surrounds you like your own guitar tech or do you have any input into choosing who the front of house guy is or the monitor guy is or how does that work i think i think there's some sound guys out there that want to know like how important it is to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as the, as the years have gone on more, uh, I guess um, pe the, the tour manager, when, when he or she is putting the, 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 the crew together, well, you ask, you know, who would you like to, to do this? And especially when it comes to monitor engineers, that seems to be a, a big one um, because you have people that understand what you like to hear and, and understand, you know, what, how to kind of navigate that realm for you. And, and as you know, Tater, I mean, it's a, it's an important, it's a very important role uh, because it can really screw up an artist's gig, you know, if he's not, he or she isn't hearing what they totally. need. Totally. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's a big, and as far, as far as guitar techs go, yeah, that's uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'll talk with Brian Marshall because we generally share that share a tech uh -huh. uh, and be like, well, who, who should we use? And um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely involved with that. And, and, at this point. Cool. I think that, you know, the question came from a place of them trying to figure out like how, how do you get chosen to be a guitar tech for, you know, Alter Bridge? Um, and, and the real answer is, is it's about relationships and how they made their journey to becoming, getting close to you enough where you could see them work. Right. I mean, Absolutely. that's really the deal. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And I know Mark had Ernie for years. I don't know who does it now. I think Ernie's retired, but I know he had Ernie. So they definitely had a long relationship. Yeah. Long term. Probably back in the Creed days. Is that probably where he came from? But yeah. So yep. Ern, Ern dog. Ern, Ern's great, man. Yeah. Ern dog. Does he still, does he still do Mar- Mark's guitars? I no, no. Um, he doesn't. And, and, and I'm, I know he was with, who is he with? Well, he was with Steely Dan for a while. Oh, which, wow. Cool. I don't know if you guys know this, but you know, I'm a crazy Steely Dan. Yes, like, I do. Know. So that was like, so what's, what's <laughs> going on? <laughs> you know? That's awesome. <laughs> well, listen, Miles, dude, we've run out of time. Um, this always flies by. And and thank you so much for giving of your time. And, and um, uh, we just love you. And uh, the fact that you came on our little show means so much to us. And, yeah. and thank you for that. Thank you for asking me. I've been looking forward to this. Right, you got you guys know how much I uh, just adore both of you. So this is this was an excuse to catch up and be bros. Yeah. And one more product plug is, uh, as you can see there, Miles is using the SE Electronics Miles Kennedy V7, uh, which is uh, an amazing sound of microphone. All you vocalists out there, uh, the V7 is um, something that Tater and I use on a lot of different artists, and um, it's. Uh, now Miles has his own signature model. That's pretty amazing. Pretty fun. I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty honored and and stoked. And I do I do love this mic. You know I've tried so many different mics, and this just was the one that finally was like that's uh, I'm I'm marrying that one. So that's awesome, man. Little little product placement for that. I was as you were talking, I saw that and went, that's great. We got to give a shout out. To, yeah, well, we're going to uh, go into that a bit on the on the Q and A how that relationship happened and. Um... Cool. Also, so. Cool. All right, guys. And all you guys that, um, you know, didn't get your question asked during this time period, we'll try to get to it in our Q and a, and that's going to get posted in the next couple of days to our YouTube channel. So like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and, uh, you'll be able to see when that comes up. Um, also next week on wrong end of the snake is smoother Smith. Smoother was born in England and went uh, through school and joined the RAF at 16. He then spent four and a half years with Pan American Airways. Then Smoother quit his real job in 1972, moved to the USA and took off to be a drum roadie for the band Flash. His next gig was Genesis with Peter Gabriel in 1973. In 1980, thanks to the generosity of Supertramp, he orchestrated the launch of Delicate Productions. Delicate Productions is an award-winning production company uh, providing audio, lighting, and video for concerts, tours, and special events based in Camarillo, California. Uh, So he's had a a real um, interesting life uh, all the way from coming from being a a pilot, as I understand, to to, uh, running a sound company. Um, So uh, that's smoother next week. Please tune into that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our videos. Um, You know, we've had over 10,000 hours of watch time to our channel. uh, And we're very grateful that you've helped us to reach this milestone. Thank you. All you uh, new people that came here to see Miles, uh, subscribe to our channel. And uh, we have all kinds of characters that come to this. And uh, subscribe to our channel and, and um, learn, some, learn some other things from some of our other guests. We appreciate you being here. Um, and also, you know, we just want to give a shout out. There's so many resources for mental health and well-being for roadies. Uh, there's the roadieclinic.com uh, on Facebook, the Loving Hands for Stage Hands. Um, and don't forget to keep the pressure on contact your representatives in the house and Senate to remind them about our forgotten industry so that we can all go back to live shows. Uh, we appreciate you miles. Thank you so much for coming and, uh, we'll see you in the Q and a period.